Hey, welcome to Branch Life Online. We're so glad that you are worshiping with us today through this video, and we're glad that this can be the way that we connect uh, during this week. We are in the middle of our Follow the Leader series, and if you've missed any of these or you'd like to catch up, you can go to our website, go to our sermon section at any time, and see this entire series. Today's going to be a special day as we tell a powerful, powerful story that shows up here in Matthew chapter 9, a story about following Jesus. Remember, the invitation is to all of us to join the crowd and follow Jesus, and we're looking at stories of who and what followed Jesus and how it made a difference for them and how it can make a difference for you. So no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, today can be a special day in that journey. As you're checking out Jesus or you're drawing closer to him, we want to invite you to join the crowd and follow Jesus. If this is your first time with us, man, we're so glad uh, that you've checked this out. We would love to connect with you. Uh, we'd love to connect with everyone who's worshiping through this video. Uh, go ahead and fill out this connection card at some point before you log out. You can find this at branchlife.church or link, the link to it is coming up in the chat feature next to you if you're watching on our website, on Facebook, or on our YouTube channel. Go ahead and like us on those social media platforms or follow. And if this has been an encouragement to you, or you just like to get the word out about Branch Life, you can share this video on those platforms. That would be awesome. We love when people share uh, Branch Life's content online and let it get spread out to the entire world. That's just one way that you, we can be about our community and loving our neighbor. So we're going to dive in in just a moment. If you're, again, first time with us, we do have a gift for you. So if you fill out your connection card, uh, we would love to be able to send you this journal. If you give us that information, we will be able to send this out to you right away as we're traveling through the book of Matthew all this year and into the beginning of next year. Hey, we're going to dive in. This is going to be an exciting morning, so don't go anywhere. Let's worship together as we continue this journey in following the leader. Hey, if you have your Bibles or your journals, grab them. We're in Matthew chapter 9, and today we're going to tell one big story. And this is one of the biggest stories we're going to be able to tell during this Follow the Leader series, because this is Matthew's story. Man, it's so important to learn about Matthew. Matthew is the writer of this book. Matthew has this incredible transformation where he goes from one end of the spectrum all the way to the other. He was fighting against faith, and he became a follower of Jesus. What would convince somebody like Matthew, who had everything in the world, who had built for him a nice, comfortable life, what would cause him to give it all up and to follow Jesus? That's the story that we're going to look at today. So go to Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to start in, the, in Matthew 9, verse 9. And it says this, as Jesus passed from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose, and he followed him. Today is all about Matthew's story. So I want you to picture just a young man growing up in Israel. A Jewish boy that was following the track of all the other Jewish boys. He had, had his time with his rabbi and trying to figure out what he was going to do with the rest of his life. But this bright young man named Levi didn't quite get to the level of some of the other boys. You see, back in Jewish culture, the boys were chosen by their rabbi to advance further in their studies. And those boys that, that kept up and were disciplined and worked hard and were honest and, and ethical, they got chosen to go to the next level. 
And all along the way, boys would be dropping out of their teaching program. Some of the other disciples that Jesus picked were fishermen. Fishermen never made it to the highest levels. They, for whatever reason, because of their family's business or whatever it may have been, uh, left their teaching time and went back and began to learn a trade. Well, Matthew was, one, uh, Levi at the time was one of those young men who was willing to do anything. Uh, he'd cut corners, he would, he would tell a lie, he would hide and sneak behind his parents' back. And probably for those reasons, he didn't make it very far in the religious setting. He wasn't able to be a part of the religious elite, so he had to find another path. The Israelite nation had been taken over by the Romans. They had been invaded and they were being ruled by this foreign land. And this, this foreign land had set up their own governors that would sit and be in charge of the Israelite people. They would take the seat of authority away from the local governors, away from the communities. In all of this time, Matthew, already being willing to cut corners, saw opportunity. You see, these invaders needed to take some from the, from the Jewish community to work for them. Matthew was chosen and willing to work for invaders. And so when he had to find a career, he chose a career that would cause him to be despised. Despised by everybody else in the community, by his own family members, by other students, by the religious elite. He began to work for the enemy and he took a position of tax collector. Taking money from his neighbors, his neighborhoods, and his family members and giving it then to the enemy, to the invaders, to the tyrants that were taking over their lives. You see, these tax collectors were chosen because they all had a unique ability to betray the ones that they loved. Matthew was then, as other tax collectors, building himself a very comfortable lifestyle. Not only did he have the favor of the Romans, but he was also able to charge as much money as he wanted take as many taxes in the name of the Romans as he wanted to take. And he could, if the Romans asked to have him collect 100 mites, he may charge 150 and keep 50 for himself. He would get then paid from the Roman Empire, but also keep for himself whatever he wanted. Because of this, Matthew became a wealthy Jewish man that worked for the Romans. Yeah, he was hated. Yeah, he was despised. People would spit in his direction when they would walk past his tax collection booth, but he was able to buy the big house on the corner with the pool in the backyard. He was able to have the nicest toys and wear the best and most current clothes of the Roman Empire. And if he would have kept working his way up, he had no limit to being a full, a full functioning member of this Roman, this Roman Empire. He could go anywhere in the world that he wanted to go. It was in the midst of this that Matthew had a life-changing experience where everything that he had known, everything that he was willing to do, all that he had built for himself would now be set aside and he would be made new. Matthew was sitting at his, at his tax collecting booth and Jesus and some of the other disciples of Jesus were coming by his oceanside city. Now at this point, Jesus was a famous character. He had done some things that had traveled quickly around the region. This Nazarene was known to heal lepers. He was known for his radical teaching of claiming to be the Messiah, the one who was prophesied from the beginning. It was said that he was born of a virgin and that he could make the lame to walk and the blind to see. He could cause the deaf to hear. And so when Jesus came to your town, there was a buzz. People would, would run out to meet him, to hear his teaching for himself, to see if he would do something miraculous in front of everyone. Now, Matthew didn't care much about Jesus. He stayed at his station. Maybe he could figure out a way to get a little more money from all the people traveling back and forth. Maybe he could tr charge an extra tax or add on an extra fee. And so when Jesus and his entourage came past Matthew's booth and Jesus stopped and turned to talk to Matthew, the others following Jesus couldn't believe it. They said, why is Jesus wasting his time with this crook and with this thief, with this person who betrayed us? 
Why would Jesus even talk to that, 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 that person who's unworthy? Jesus is so much better than this. And they couldn't believe it when not only did Jesus stop and look that way, but he walked over to Matthew and with compassion in his eyes, but confidence in his word, Jesus takes his hand and sets it on Matthew's shoulder and he says to Levi, follow me. Jesus calls Matthew in this moment to become a follower of Jesus. Imagine the disciples behind them going, wait, he's inviting a tax collector to become one of us. Imagine Matthew's disbelief when he saw a rabbi coming to him, putting his hand on his shoulder and touching him and saying, I choose you to be a follower of me. I choose you to be among the elite. Matthew thought to himself, does he know who I am? Does he know what I've done? Does he know where I've been? Does he know that nobody will listen to me and nobody will follow me? Why would he call me to be one of his disciples? In those same moments, Matthew had to think about his response to the calling and to the shock of everyone and maybe even to Matthew himself. He rises up and he follows Jesus in that moment. You see, Matthew's story starts with a crooked young man willing to cross bridges, uh, really willing to cheat, willing to betray, to become someone who will now lay all his life on the line to follow Jesus. He's going to give up his comfort, his status, his home, and his future for a future that is new. Why would anybody, why would Matthew stop and sacrifice all of that to follow Jesus. Well, if you knew what Matthew knew, if you saw what Matthew saw, you would possibly and probably make the same choice that Matthew gave. Remember, Matthew is the disciple who followed Jesus and eventually wrote this gospel that we're reading. From chapter 1 all the way to the end of somewhere around chapter 29, You are hearing from Matthew himself about what he was experiencing, what he was thinking, and why he was willing to give ultimately his life for Jesus. Why not only was he willing to follow him in this life, but he was willing to give him his very life to promote that Jesus was God. You see, there was three things that Matthew tells us about why he decided to follow Jesus. In these three moments, Matthew brings to us this incredible, uh, this incredible argument, this incredible discussion. Imagine sitting around the table with Matthew and saying, Matthew, why? Why did you follow Jesus? And Matthew would say, listen, I got to tell you three things about Jesus that changed my life. And the first thing is Jesus ate with everybody. If you have your Bibles in Matthew chapter 9, right after this story, we see this, this incredible this incredible reaction to the time of Matthew's calling. And in chapter 9, it says, Jesus then reclined at the table in the house. So in this calling, Matthew says, I'm going to follow you here. Come to my house. And he takes him to this nice house. And Jesus lies down with Matthew and the only other people that would come to Matthew's house. It was other tax collectors. It was other sinners. It was other traitors. It was other outcasts. And Jesus is reclining at the table, enjoying a fellowship meal and enjoying his conversation with them. And Matthew is shocked by the pleasantness and the grace that's in Jesus' eyes. He's used to being spit on. He's used to being yelled at. He's used to being kicked out by other people and left alone. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus reclined at his table. And the Pharisees, even to the other disciples, looked at all of this and said, Why? Why is your teacher with the tax collectors and the sinners? And Jesus replies, with this famous statement in Matthew chapter 11, those who are well have no need of a physician. I have not come to save the righteous, but to save the sinner. We're going to see in just a couple of minutes how this reflects maybe more than any other statement, the heart of our God who we follow. But you know this is true. You don't go hang out in a hospital just because you're healthy. 
you go to a hospital because you're not feeling well. I remember me and Pastor Scott in our college days, we were having a great time together after one of our banquets, and we had about 10 or 15 of our friends came over to my house. We were running around uh, after a long drive in the, in the night, and I knew where we were going, but Scott didn't. And as we were running around with our friends, just kind of hanging out, having a good time, Scott tripped over a grassy knoll, and he landed face first in a parking lot. When he landed, he never had the wherewithal or the opportunity to get his hands up. So his face took the brunt of that fall. He hit that paved top and he slid across it. I remember turning around after, after Scott fell and coming over to him and flipping him over. It looked like someone had taken a baseball bat and sandpaper to his face. So immediately I called 911. He's unconscious on the road. We call 911. The ambulance comes. They put him in the ambulance bay, and they allow me to ride in the front. So I'm on my way to the hospital with my friend Scott in these college days, and we get to the hospital, and the doctors focused all their time and energy and effort on Scott. They wanted to help him because he was sick, because he was hurt, because he was broken, because he was injured. And I watched the doctors all helping Scott, and I realized, me, I'm perfectly healthy, I'm perfectly fine, there's no reason for me to be here in the hospital, and those moments became overwhelmed. And because I was healthy, nobody was paying attention to me, I end up passing out in the emergency room. In those moments, crawling out to the outside, a security guard comes over to me and says, young man, are you okay? And I just needed some fresh air. I didn't need to be admitted to the hospital. Scott did. I wasn't the one that was injured. Scott was. Those doctors ran to Scott's side because, those, because Scott was in need of saving. That's what God had done, done for us. That's why Jesus reclined at the table with sinners and tax collectors because they needed saving. They needed kindness. They needed grace. They needed friendship. They needed help. It is hard to save someone who doesn't think they need to be saved. It's almost impossible. But Jesus spent time explaining and showing and demonstrating their need of salvation. He spent time with broken people. And in this world, a little kindness and a little grace will go a long way. That's why Matthew was willing to follow Jesus in those moments. The second reason Matthew followed Jesus is because Jesus makes all things new. Jesus had already built a reputation for giving the blind new sight, for giving the deaf new hearing, and for giving his disciples new life. In the continuation of Matthew chapter 9, he gets a question from the Pharisees about fasting. And Matthew says, writing the story, it had a huge impact on him. And, and in the Jewish culture, the Jewish leaders had a, a pattern of fasting where they would announce to the world that Tuesdays and Thursdays are fasting days or whatever days it was in their calendar. And everybody would know they were fasting. They'd wear different clothes. They would put ash on their faces. And it became a regular part of their instructions to let the world know that they were fasting. Now, Jesus told his disciples not to do that. He told them not to go around acting that way. As a matter of fact, he said, when you fast, fast in private. Again, that was mind-blowing. And so this is what gets challenged. And Jesus gives a couple of metaphors that you could read for yourself about not putting a a, a new piece of cloth that hasn't shrunk yet on an old piece of cloth. And when you wash it, it's going to shrink again. He tells that story. And then he says, listen, you don't put new wine into old wineskins. Why don't you do that? Well, because the old wineskin leaks. The old wineskin's going to, you're going to lose all your new wine. You put new wine into new wineskins. And here comes Jesus with this brand new message, with, with this message of hope, with this message of I'm the Messiah, with the message that God has. And he wants to give it to people who are made new. He doesn't want to give us to the righteous elite who are absolutely convinced of their way and, and they, they have no other. He doesn't want to give it to the naturalists who say, I can only believe in what I can see and what I can feel. He wanted to give it to people that were willing to have their hearts made new because this powerful gospel, this new gospel, this new message that was being brought to the earth was, was got to be continued on. It was going to be given to people who were made new. And so not only was he causing the lame to have new legs, he was giving followers of Jesus, the crowds that followed Jesus, new life, new purpose, new hope, new peace. 
And these followers of Jesus, they were different, they were radical, they were special. They were amazing in so many ways. And, and Matthew saw this and he said, I want what they have. I want to be new like they are new. And if you're a follower of Jesus, do other people want what you have? Not the house that you live in, not the car that you drive, not your special athletic ability, but do they want the peace that you have in this crisis that we've been going through of a pandemic and, and we're, we're concerned about variants and we're concerned about, about what the kids are going to do in school next week and, and we've got, had to go through this whole year. Were you one of those Christians that panicked? Were you one of those Christians that yelled at people? Were you one of those Christians that, that just kind of started throwing shade and correcting everybody's behavior? Or were you a Christian that carried a quiet, peaceful confidence where your friends and neighbors could look at you and say, why are you so confident? Why, why do you have peace? Why, why are you being kind to me in this moment? Were you one of those Christians that because you knew you had faith in Jesus and, and you knew his guidelines, you knew his instructions, you knew that he wins in the end, that you were okay, but you could then turn around and help someone else? That quiet, confident Christian that is full of grace and kindness who in, in a time of crisis can help someone, who in a time of crisis can take their eyes off of, of their own concerns and, and put it on meeting the needs of others, that's contagious. That's when other people look at you and say, I, I want that. I want to be part of that. And Matthew said that this Jesus, he makes people new. This thieving traitor who had all the riches but was still empty inside, who had all, all that this world could offer, yet felt like he had no reason to wake up in the morning, realized that Jesus could make him new. And Jesus did just that. He made Matthew a follower. He made him new and he took his, his new wine. He poured it into new wineskins. And Matthew now takes this story and this message around the world through his gospel from generation to generation he is made new in this moment so that others can see this newness and the third reason Matthew would tell you that he followed Jesus was because he saw Jesus's power he saw Jesus's power over death in Matthew chapter 9 in verse 18 he tells the story of, of a ruler that came and knelt before Jesus. And this ruler knelt before Jesus and announced the hardest thing that anybody could announce ever. He says to Jesus, my daughter has died. Just, just hold on to the pain in that moment. I can't imagine ever having to say the sentence, my daughter has died. Matthew, being an eyewitness to this moment, wonders along with everyone else, what is Jesus going to do? And then the father in his desperation and his hope looks up at Jesus and says, but, but if you lay your hand on her, she will live. He believed that Jesus could give his daughter new life. And as the story goes on, through a series of healings, Jesus says to the dad, he said, go, for your girl is not dead. She's only sleeping. Imagine he rushes through the crowd and he tries, he tries to get as quick as he can to his daughter to find her, find her sleeping. She's, she's alive. He wakes her up and he hugs her and he, he holds her in his arms. The daughter who was dead is now completely brought to life and and Matthew is seeing that Jesus has power, power over blindness, power over death, power over lameness, power over sin, power over demons. And he tells us in verse 27, in verse 32, in verse 38, he talks about all of these stories 
where Jesus heals more people. He causes the mute to be able to speak. That This is the first story in the book of Matthew where someone is resurrected from the dead. And Jesus is proving his power over death itself. It mirrors the moment that Jesus himself will rise from the dead, rise from his own grave after his death on the cross. And Matthew is saying, how could I not follow Jesus who had power over death? If you saw Jesus make the blind to see and raise the dead to life again, what would you do with that Jesus? In this moment, this is why Matthew joined the crowd and followed Jesus. Jesus was kind and he was graceful, uh, grace-filled. Jesus created and made it all things new and Jesus had the power over life and death itself. You know, as you think about Matthew's story, there's probably many questions you could consider. I want to encourage you on your connection cards to go ahead and write any questions <clears throat> that you might have. And we've been getting these questions and questions like this, and we want to answer some from time to time in our teaching. But Matthew heard the call of God. He heard the call of Jesus very literally. And when Jesus put his hand on his shoulder and said, Matthew, follow me, Matthew knew that Jesus was calling him to be a follower of God. How do you hear the call of God? How do you know if Jesus is calling you to be a disciple, if Jesus is calling you to be a believer? Well, as far as salvation is concerned, it's very simple. Jesus is calling all of us unto salvation. Jesus gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you're watching this, and if you're even considering a relationship with Jesus, you are being called. The, the power of God is drawing you to himself, and he's giving you an invitation to be a follower of Jesus. You could hear it in the restlessness of a sleepless night. You could hear it in the repetition of your thoughts and your minds. You can hear it in the sermons that are taught by followers of God, in the kindness of a friend, in the invitation from others. If someone has invited you to be a part of this recording, a part of this teaching, that that's the voice of God calling you to salvation because Jesus' will that all of us should be saved. That's why he gave his son. But, but for those of us who are followers of God, how do you hear the call of God to go into ministry? How do you hear the call of God to step out into faith, to reach out in love to others? It's a really, really good question. Last week I told a little bit about my story about starting and planting Branch Life Church and this question was asked, how did I hear God tell me to do that? I can tell you very, very distinctly that it was a, a series of confirmations. I heard God in a, in a conversation with other men and women of God as we sat together and we talked about the future and we talked about the, the need for planting churches. I heard God after a personal series, season of personal fasting and prayer. I remember getting away from my regular routine and going on vacation on a trip with my family. And during that trip, spending time in prayer to hear from God about the direction he would have us to go. And in my spirit and in my mind, it wasn't an audible discussion from God, but it was a confirmation of the direction. He gave my heart peace. He gave my mind peace. He gave us a, a confidence in those moments. He gave me unity with my wife. She heard the same thing. She, she felt the same leading. We, we had been given release in our lives to take this step so much so that if we didn't take it, we knew that it would, be, it would be against God's call. And then God confirmed it in every conversation, in every, uh, in every meeting, and in every follow-up. As we thought this was the way to go, we confirmed it in the counsel of many. So I heard God in the quietness of, of prayer. Again, not a voice booming out of the sky but a leading in the spirit. I heard it through counsel of friends and family. I heard it in the discussion of my wife. What does then, the next question that I want you to consider today, and remember Matthew heard the call of God and immediately had to consider his life. What does the direction of your resources say about what you follow? If you claim to be a follower of God, do your, does your life, does your life's resources prove that you're a follower of God. You see, so many of us have spent so much time, energy, and effort 
We, sit, we spend our priceless moments and our priceless possessions and our priceless relationships on the pursuit of what we follow. I've known, I've known some young adults that follow the next level in the video game. So much so that they abandon their schoolwork, they abandon their relationships so they can spend time, energy, and effort and, and money on equipment so that they can go to the next level in that game. Well, what, what are you spending your time on? What are you following? You're following that game. Maybe it's pursuit of more followers on social media. What are you following? If that's what you spend your energy on, you're spending your energy on following, uh, following social trends. Maybe it's a, a, another position in a job. Maybe it's a sport. Maybe it's a, a, a cheering for a sport. But where do your resources go? And if you say you're following Jesus, are your resources confirming that? Here's the thing that happened with Matthew, a very wealthy yet immoral man. Matthew demonstrates to us this incredible, powerful truth that he was one sinner saved by grace no longer distracted by his resources, and he changed the world. You see, Matthew's resources were all pointed towards himself and his own embitterment. But when he followed Jesus, he was no longer distracted by his pursuit of resources. He wasn't willing to cut the line. He wasn't willing to lie. He wasn't willing to be unethical anymore. And Matthew, now no longer distracted by his resources, turned all of his time, energy, and effort on Jesus. Matthew was the one who gave money towards Christ. Matthew was the one that gave up his house to follow him. Matthew now said, everything that I have, everything that I am is now yours. Matthew's story is one of the most powerful examples of forgiveness that is offered to everyone. If God would be willing to accept Matthew, the lying traitor as a disciple, if he could trust the untrustable, if he could fix the, all, the, the broken of the most broken of the broken, then he can do that for you. This is all of our stories when we follow Jesus. Jesus takes our brokenness, our broken hearts, our broken relationships, the horrible things that we've done, the corners that we've cut, and he gives us kindness and grace and forgiveness. If we follow him, he makes us new. Are you ready for a new life? Are you ready for a new direction? You see, this is the heart of God. God has not come to help the healthy. They don't need a doctor, but God has come to call the righteous, not to call the righteous, but the sinners. He's calling all of us who have a sin problem to him, and he's saying to the disciples, when you follow me, your passion will be to help the lost. Your mission will be to reach the lost and to give the good news of Jesus to everyone around the world. You see, at the end of this chapter, in chapter 9 and verse 36, it says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. There's many people who are broken, who need a new life. They need the message of Jesus. But the laborers are few. There's few that are willing to give up their resources to reach the harvest. There are few that are willing to follow me, to stop paying attention and being distracted by the things of this world, and to start following full-hearted after God. You see, there are many of us in this world today who say we follow Jesus, but we are all in it for ourselves. And when we become followers of Jesus, we're not in it for ourselves, we're in it for the sinner. We're in it for the lost. We're in it to reach those people that are hopeless and helpless. And in this year, you have probably spent a lot of time and energy and effort, emotional resources, financial expense to protect yourself, to help yourself, to guard yourself in this season. And that is natural. Everybody in the world did that. But Christians spend time, energy, and effort, even in a time of crisis, to help the lost, to help the helpless, and the homeless, to help those that don't have hope. We have the hope of eternal life in Jesus Christ. In next week's talk, we're going to see what it, what it means to be one of these disciples of Jesus who are focused on the harvest, to be answering the call of Jesus in our lives. And Matthew leads us in this discussion. And Jesus is saying, listen, 
We need to pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Matthew, you are going from a tax collector collecting money for the Romans to being a collector of souls for eternity. You are now a laborer for Jesus Christ and God is calling you as a follower of Jesus to do the same. So here's questions to consider. First to the crowd. Are you ready to leave your old life for a new life with Jesus. Listen, if you got saved and your life before looks exactly like it did now, you're missing something. Something's not quite there. Have you made Jesus the Lord of your life or are you just kind of buying a ticket for eternity? Is this something that you've committed to follow him or are you just kind of raising your hand saying that's nice and you live the rest of your life? Is it something that your family had you grow up in? Listen, when you follow Jesus, you leave your old life and everything becomes new. New attitude, new hope, new, new direction of resources, new purpose, and new mission. I, I, I can't help but think about all of these athletes in, during this Olympic time who have struggled with what they call the weight of gold. Michael Phelps, who had so many gold medals, went through a series of, of uh, trying times which included addiction and depression. Depression. The number one tennis player in the world skips a major tournament to focus on her mental health. And Simone Baez can't even compete in the all-around competition because mentally she's not prepared. These young people going through an incredibly difficult season are finding the weight of living for this world is more that they can bear. And maybe you're living with the weight of this world trying to get to the next level, trying to buy the next thing, trying to pay the next bill, trying to go with the next relationship that'll fix everything. Jesus is calling you to become a follower of him. It's not about the gold medals. It's not about being at the peak of our athletic abilities. It's not about the, next, uh, the nicer house or the next level. It's about new life with Jesus. That's what gives us purpose. That's what gives us meaning. That's what gives us hope. You've been designed to have this new life with Jesus. Are you ready? If you're ready to follow Jesus, I want to invite you into a personal relationship with him. You can go to branchlife.church and you can click on the gospel tab. We'll show it to you a little bit later. But simply just go all in with Jesus. Tell him that you're sorry for your sins. Like Matthew, we're all sinners. Tell him that you, you want forgiveness of your sins and you believe that Jesus is God, that he died on the cross and he rose again for our sins and, and that he can come and save us. Accept that free gift of salvation in this moment. And if today you've made that decision or you want to pray that prayer, would you let us know by filling out that on the connection card? Say, today I've decided to follow Jesus. And disciple, follower of Jesus, you've been saved. You are ready to go all in. You're a part of his church. What would you be willing to give to change a life forever? It's a powerful question. A lot of us would say anything anything here at branch life church we ask you to give three things number one we ask you to pray would you give prayer would you pray for one two three people by name every day that need to know jesus we ask you to give yourself your relationships invest in kindness and time and energy and effort we ask you to to then invite but what would you give if it meant your neighbor, your friend, your, your family member, your coworker, or your classmate could know Jesus and be changed forever? Is it everything? And do your use of resources prove that that's your mission? You see, Matthew was one sinner saved by grace, no longer distracted by his resources, who changed the world. You see, Matthew, when, when he saw Jesus ascend into heaven and said, hey, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to do everything that I command you, took that seriously. And Matthew then traveled the known world for the rest of his life, teaching people about Jesus and starting this thing called the church. You see, Matthew was all in with the church. And he spread the news of Jesus through starting churches all over the known world, ultimately giving up his own life, 
dying the death of a martyr so that Jesus' name could be made great in his life and in his death. You see, Matthew shows us that found people find people. Who? Who are you praying for? If you're willing to share the first name of your one or the person you're praying for, we'd like to pray alongside you. Just go ahead and fill out your connection card and give us that first name, whether it's Sarah or Steve or Jim or Chuck or Joanne, whoever it might be. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a son or a daughter of yours. Maybe it's a, a, a distant cousin. Maybe it's a stranger that you met on the street last week. But let's today start with our most powerful resource prayer and then ask God to show us exactly what to give and exactly what to do this week so that others could hear the call to follow Jesus. Are you all in? Are you one man changed by grace, no longer distracted by your resources? Well, we want you to consider those things today. Man, thank you so much for joining us. Jo- during this next song, you can take some time and, l- and fill out your connection card. And we want you to come back next week as this discussion is to be continued as we go into another set of powerful stories of why you should join the crowd and follow Jesus. Thanks for joining us today. We'd love to hear from you. Take a moment to fill out that card and join us next week. Have a good rest of your day. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new eyes. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. So You are making